thank you, thank you. All right, so I'm Cassie Crossley. I'm with, I see all the cameras, all my friends. Uh, I'm with Schneider Electric. I am the Vice President for Supply Chain Security. Uh, if you don't know what that is, uh, it's sort of a different kind of role. I have been with the company 14 years. We sell a lot of products. I'll show you some of the brands in a few minutes. And uh, I am a product security officer, also from the CISO, Cybersecurity and Product Security Organization. So I'm gonna talk about SBOMs, Software Bill of Materials, but the rest of the time I'm gonna say SBOMs, except for as people come in, I might repeat that once or twice, and how we leverage them. But first, let me tell you a bit about who our company is, just so you know, uh, we are not German. We are headquartered in France, and we are a 36 billion euro company. We are spread all around the world. We do a lot of products, the reason I mentioned the ICS Village is uh, we have a lot of products for industrial control systems and we have building operation systems. So you might recognize some of the names, Aviva, uh, that's, uh, you know, you might find that in manufacturing, APC. Who had an APC, you know, unit sitting on their desk in the 80s and 90s? Yep, that's ours. Uh, but we do a lot of product secure power products for data centers. Uh, also Square D, who's seen Square D panels all over the decades, that's one of our brands. So you, you, know, you probably know us from our brands. I may not necessarily know Schneider Electric because we get asked, you know, do we do uh, elevators, escalators, so on and so forth. And we're not a trucking company either. So that's who we are. Now, what I'm going to be talking about today is a part of that supply chain. So I work with a just wonderful organization, 140,000 employees. We have over 54,000 suppliers. Many of them, uh, let's say over 20,000 of them, are part of what we call direct. That means that they work with our products. So if you look at our product portfolio, we have hundreds of thousands of SKUs. Not all of them are intelligent SKUs. They could be cables. They could be any kind of non-intelligent device. Intelligent devices, over 10,000. Uh, so those are ones that may have uh, firmware. We also have software, cloud products, mobile apps, things like that. Just all the range, that's what we have. So I'm gonna be talking about those digital products today. With those suppliers, about 2,000 or more of them actually provide us, it could be software libraries, it can be uh, manufacturing equipment systems and platforms where they're flashing firmware. We can work with suppliers who are doing our development. So there's all these different kinds of suppliers that we're working with. And I wanted to just explain that from a footprint standpoint, because from a software and firmware point of view, it's not just Schneider Electric employees that are all part of this supplier ecosystem. And so I know this is an eye chart. I just wanted to show it so you can, uh, if you want, there's other uh, presentations I've done and I can provide this. This is a PDF that I've got. And this is our supply chain security platform. I just bring it up because I wanted to represent, uh, we're going to be talking about the software bill materials. That's the operational group that I run, but I'm also, you know, these initiatives are all part of the supply chain security at our company, 13 initiatives. And so I know you can't read it, so I'm gonna go through it real quickly so you understand traversally. There are supply chain digital policies, customer authority and requirements, third party cybersecurity, it's a lot of what I'm working on, vulnerability management, which is part of this talk, this how we use SBOMs as part of that. We've got cyber defense and incident response. And then you've got on the left, you've got secure development and design. And so you've got product and system security. As a product security officer, that's you know a lot of what the world I was when I was owning a lot, most, you know, a lot of that team from the governance. Then you've got SBOMs, and then you've got uh, the R&D activities for cybersecurity. If you ever want to see this talk described, uh, if you go onto YouTube, S4 for this past year, which is an industrial control conference, you should be able to search for S4 and my name and find the YouTube video, or just hit me up on LinkedIn. 
And then there's technology validation. Think of pen testing, working with third party companies and organizations, but also uh, different organizations like the Department of Energy to test our products. And then source code governance, big, big thing that everybody should be doing. If not, we need to you know, uh, ramp that up for everybody else. Uh, the middle one is industrial control, uh, industrial activities. So how we manage our floors um, and our production lines and then project supply chain security, which is if we're doing the projects to actually deploy it. And lastly, uh, customer facing activities. So I wanted to just give you a view I am going to concentrate today on software bill of materials and the initiative. And I'm gonna go through just a sort of primer. If you don't know what a software bill of materials is, if you have not had to create one or ingest one, that's, or, you know, there's different terms for that word too, is I've created a picture uh, based off of uh, what we would explain it to our internal organization is that this software bill material, standard kind of tree structure, think about it that way, is you have a product over here on the right. It can have first level dependencies, uh, which could be commercial libraries. It could be an embedded operating system in the case of firmware. It could be proprietary software, so that's code that our teams have written. It can have open source libraries. People sometimes think when they're scanning, oh, just, you know, just the open source libraries and SBOMs. Not, not that. I mean, you at least would have, if you've written any code, you've got your own proprietary library or something listed. And then those products and, and different systems and areas can all have what we call transitive dependencies. So inside, for example, open source libraries can call other libraries, right? Um, and those are all transitive dependencies. So, and you may not know them, what, what's being called, especially if it's a .NET DLL, Right? So I don't have the SBOM yet for the .NET DLL. If anybody does have it, please send it to me. Um, I would, I would uh, really like to see a lot of these libraries, especially binaries, that uh, are frequently used um, for us to be able to have access to those. And it'll be coming. So what I wanted to talk about just for a second next is just the journey because it was it played an important part with where we are and there's always time to catch the train. And what we did is all of a sudden back in the uh, 2019, I received a contract from a customer, a utility saying, give us your SBOM, and I'm like, well, what's that? And uh, so I found out about the, our teams knew, our vulnerability management teams knew, and they said, hey, there's this NTIA initiative, so I immediately got on board with uh, one of the working groups, and then I you know, continued working with them, and we created an adoption and awareness group. So since 2020, I've been helping deliver the message of SBOMs. At that same time, uh, we had COVID, but the executive order in May of 2020 came out. Well, I helped work on the, uh, the let's just say the definition for SBOM by that time, because I had been working with them. So at 2020, we have that executive order called 14028 in the US that mentions SBOMs and gives a definition and told NTIA to give up minimum elements, like what should you put into it to distribute it. And that played a key role in really moving things forward as an industry to like have something that specifically mentions it and carried forward. So this is a slide where I talk about sort of the drivers for it. Um, it was really important because not everybody sells to utilities, right? So until then, really only those of us in, that are in that space were being asked for SBOMs. And it was in the contract, but not actually requested. So when the executive order came out, I required our teams to start uh, the concept of SBOMs, and when I say teams, I'm talking about the product development teams. So I, in the governance group, I owned the secure development lifecycle policy. So what I did is I modified that policy saying every team must provide an SBOM or provide us the, you know, the binary or whatever so we could scan it to create the SBOM. So that was in 2020, June of 2020. I changed the rule to say starting in January of 21, I'm going to start requiring SBOMs from every single team. And so, and so 
We have, I told you, tens of thousands of projects. We have 500 projects going on at a time. So there's a lot of releases going on, um, and the technologies can be all over the place, right? So as I mentioned, but there's also legacy platforms and legacy software that we're usually updating once a year. Some products are more frequent, but in a firmware world, uh, a lot of the products, they have to go through regression testing, interoperability, safety testing. So they go through this cycle of product development, and with all of these projects, um, they do not have, let's just say, the majority of them do not have modern CI CD pipelines, all right? If they do, it's like super cool and super easy, but most of them don't. So with the re these requirements, we had to figure out how are we gonna build this process to start getting SBOMs so that in 21, the next, that next year, we can start delivering them to our customers. And so as part of that, I worked with a consultant company and really said, okay, I'm, I've got this idea for a process. I need to be able to collect it. I need to be able to get all my proprietary information, all of the information from maybe third-party code and then also open source code. And of course, if we have the actual code generating it, uh, you know, on site, it can generate the SBOM. I'll talk more about the binary analysis generation in a minute. But what we do is we were bringing them all together. At first, we were collecting the binaries and creating the scans and storing them in box folders and then later SharePoint folders. But I knew that wasn't gonna be sufficient because when providing all of those, so an SBOM is per version, product released version. So like some of those products are only gonna have one a year. But some of them, uh, in, that if they release quarterly or more frequently, especially some software applications, they were going to have to have you know, more frequent SBOMs. So we're talking, my expectation is, you know, with versions, thousands and thousands and thousands of SBOMs. So a lot of companies may only have to think about, oh, for internal, you know, for releasing to customers, I may only have to do 10 or 20. Well, I, I knew that wasn't gonna be my case, so I needed to be able to think about how am I also gonna distribute it and use it both internally, but also to customers. And so uh, we went through, at the time where I was working on this process, started going through uh, a, an understanding and a process to say, okay, I need a tool that can do all of you know what I really want to be able to do, which is be able to provide it to customers in a secure manner, because as I mentioned at the beginning, we are critical infrastructure. And uh, I was one of the ones that were loudly saying, I'm not gonna give an SBOM, I'm not putting it on the web unless it was you know, probably a, a home product. Uh, we do sell some of those in Europe. But for critical infrastructure, uh, it would require an NDA. And another thing about Schneider Electric is we don't do a lot of our direct sales. We go through engineering firms, there's integrators, there's all sorts of ways that products can be sold. And so I only know about 36 to 40% of my direct customers. So we needed to be able to say, okay, you have this product, um, we wanna sign an NDA because I don't have a direct contract with them. And this is, I think, for those of us in the critical infrastructure, pretty much that's how the groups are, are working with. Now, I get requests today from uh, customers that we directly sell to, customers that go through integrators. I get requests from the labs that we're specifically working with, like with Department of Energy, where we've had um, work with them. And all of them, they're able to go into this tool that I'm gonna talk about in a moment. But the um, indirect customers, my, my vision and what I'm working on is that I would provide the SBOMs to asset management companies because if you look at this room and there's sensors and everything, you know, hopefully this convention center has an asset inventory. Cross your fingers. Um, but likely it doesn't even have the firmware registered in that asset inventory. So the SBOM really can't do the building maintenance staff and the facility management any good if it's an SBOM from the current one, if they're running a version from like 
you know, three years ago. And that's a problem right now in the software bill of materials industry. It's great for procurement for you to be able to ask and say, hey, what's in here? But if you want to use it for some operational and risk analysis, and I'll talk more about that, but if you want to do that, you need to know what version you're running. And so understanding that and working with that indirect customer pipeline is something that I'm focused on. Also, CP cert. So if you don't know internal, we've got a product cert uh, team that works with all of our different organizations and business units and lines of business. And they are the ones that help focus on if there's new uh, celebrity CVEs that come out, but also if we're doing disclosures and such. And they need to be able to search that. And that's really why the vulnerability management team knew about SBOMS because they wanted to be able to leverage it. And so I'm going to be showing you exactly how that happens uh, in a moment. But the internal dev teams, um, I'm a developer by background really long ago, but I've led a lot of dev teams, you know, up until about 10 years ago. I swapped back and forth between development and IT. And I know that I kept lists of, let's just say, open source or licensed information in, sp in spreadsheets, right? I mean, and then we just put it there. We wouldn't update. We, you know, nobody, it would just stay there, like, right? I did it for the legal reasons, so somebody checked it out, and I'm good, and I don't go on. Well, for a lot of us that are working with older technologies, being able to uh, really re-examine those libraries didn't start happening until vulnerabilities came about. And, uh, you know, obviously there's some classic vulnerabilities, especially in our space. There can be some on proprietary software, but things that you would normally see like Log4j and other ones that I'm going to talk about. And the development teams needed to have that information quickly because every time there was a CVE, somebody would go, hey, you know, do you got this? Do you got this? Do you got this? And we had a really organized fashion to do it, but it's still time consuming. And that's where we're headed with our SBOM vulnerability management program. So I just talked about the vulnerabilities. Here's sort of a picture of what happens is we're issuing that request to the teams. So I told you, you know, we've got 500 projects going on at a time, but we've got thousands of SKUs, right? And when somebody has to identify a vulnerability, they have to look at, well, was it in this other version? You know, did we update it? Because something like OpenSSL, when it had, uh, when it had some vulnerabilities, but only in certain versions, they have to know exactly which version. So that could have been that way in version 7, but not in version 9. So it's a lot of... I lost. Okay. It's a lot of work for these teams. Um, and then, of course, if it happens at Christmas or, you know, in August or whatever, it's even, you know, it takes longer for that analysis. Um, so all of that work for identifying the vul vulnerabilities, we issue these impact assessments. And with the SBOMs, what we're able to do now is look more specifically by saying, okay, we're going to look at our SBOMs and actually make sure that those teams are responding, first of all. But secondly, we're able to give them an indicator saying, hey, this is showing in your SBOM, you know, please uh, make sure you, you work on it and prioritize it um, and make sure it happens right away because we like to issue those security bulletins, especially for celebrity CVEs you know, as soon as possible, and they get updated. So the log for J1, we issued one within just a couple days, and we kept appending and updating it as more information from other teams came about, we would add that data. Now, one thing that was interesting uh, for that is I had a customer uh, come to me and they said, you know, you, you changed it. You said you weren't affected, and then you were. I said, that's because we heard, of, you know, a third-party proprietary library was affected. And so we had to update our, our issue, you know, our list to say that product was affected and here's, you know, the mitigation or the patch or whatever happened in that case. And that's the importance of SBOMs. If I had had at least some indication, I would have known to go to that third party right then or that product team would. But without having those third party SBOMs and... If they have the source code, they can do, you know, scanning and evaluation. But if it's a binary or, you know, we don't have all the information, then 
were, you know, having to go and query and query and query. So it's really important for us and for you all to have that additional information and that transparency. Now, I can't necessarily say it's affected, and that's the most important part of all of this, is an SBOM cannot say, I am affected, yes, no. So I'm going to say that one more time. An SBOM will not tell you by itself if I am affected, yes or no. There's something that we're working on as an industry called VEX, the Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange. And that would say, for those two CVEs for Log4J, it could be an in-progress, it could say not affected, it could say affected and here's a patch, or, you know, not in this, there's different statuses. That will give you the answer. And I mentioned, I provide a picture in my book to say, if you are looking, and I'll talk about my book in a sec, but... Uh, if you are looking to see if you're affected, you will not be able to make the final decision, just like that CP cert team that we have can't decide for that product team. Somebody's actually on that team validating it. And in the future, you know, as much as you can say that version, but anybody who's a developer here knows you can backport patches. And so you could have already had a security patch for that in the product. You could have not used certain pieces of that library. You could have done different things. And that's everything that as the actual team has to answer. And so what this has done for us is it's sped up our time. So we have gone through you know, just a very long multiple year process where we've been working and collecting these SBOMs but also, you know, we want to be able to speed up our teams, uh, reduce noise, you know, bring it really to a point. So we had two main metrics that we've been following is a reduction of staff hours. And uh, we have definitely have improved that by over half. And uh, that's a big deal when you're talking about the size that we are doing. So not only is it the reduction of staff hours from the vulnerability team, but Let's say you have a product that's um, multi years old, and uh, you know, let's let's say uh, Sarah takes over the maintenance of that. She doesn't have the ten years history of that code all the time. But if she knew that the from the S bomb that it has that library, she'll be able to go and look and be able to dig into it. So instead of wading through, you know, a lot of just different kinds of things, we're able to help pinpoint and be able to give some direction so we can get started faster. But also, the reduction in time to identify that vulnerability component is when OpenSSL, even in November of 2022, uh, when they released that, they were gonna release two, and they did, um, to say it's gonna be in these, this version. That's all we got was a heads up, which was awesome. And what that did is we were able to generate every single library or every single product that we knew that we had the records for the SBOM to be able to tell those teams, hey, get ready. You know, set aside some times for a couple days. So if you are an open source maintainer, if you can do that for me in the future, I would love you because I absolutely can use that knowledge just like for OpenSSL to say, okay, everybody, heads up. You know, this is gonna come down the pike. And so for what we're doing, and these are screen ca captures from our SBOM management solution that's from Cybeats. And I was the first customer and I gave them my design of what I wanted and they've added so much more to it because I need to be able to search and do this quickly. Um, and I had a, a lot of additional requirements about how am I going to search and I want to be able to see, you know, all the known exploitable vulnerabilities really quick, you know, things that my scanner tools, because one thing I didn't mention, and I mentioned it on the summary, is that with the binary analysis, and I think those that are in this world, it, it's only... It's only as good as it's good. And most of the time it can identify open source and it'll get close enough to the version of what it is. But if you have two versions of something and it's 1.21 and 1.22, sometimes it can't tell the difference, right? So 
you know, it may say it's one version or another and the teams have to validate that. So, but also it doesn't pick up proprietary open source. I mean, proprietary code or libraries. So it doesn't identify my libraries and we're working closely with binary scanners that we use to do that. Um, and then it uh, doesn't always identify, and most of the time doesn't identify commercial components. It can identify Java libraries and .NET libraries. But if I've purchased a commercial library, whether it be the source code or binaries or something, or libraries, you know, it can't necessarily have the signatures for those because it's not a common thing uh, and it will not be able to identify. I did a binary scan of one of our um, more older uh, secure power APS, uh, a APC products, and it had 10 commercial libraries that we had purchased like over a decade ago. It didn't find any of them because it didn't have enough of inf that information and those signatures. So that's why moving it into the pipelines where you're building those SBOMs is important. And so here, you know, what we've done is you know, we can't augment. So in those scanning tools, you know, they're just catching up. They've got the SBOMs, but for me to be able to add additional information, especially proprietary components and the other uh, commercial components, I'm not able to make those kind of adjustments. So in this tool, we're able to correct the version numbers. We're able to add additional components that we're seeing and put it right into there. So I can check, I personally, for our group, only store the production version, but I can do searches for development versions and things like that. Uh, but I, because of the my volume, I only am focused on the production version. So I talked about the open SSL. So I know it's a bit harder to see on this screen right, right from here, but I can see the various versions. So this really helps when I told you that open SSL had it in just a few different uh, library version, so it was like 1.2, 1.3, but not 1.1 and 1.4 and so on and so forth. Um, and it could be uh, something out of this package library or, you know, in this repository if it was, you know, in different areas. And so it's able to identify this screen capture. I, I took one just to show you. It has, um, in this version of OpenSSL, there's a low, one low CVE and one medium. And what I can do is I can, and I didn't take screen captures, so I wouldn't be showing the product names, but I can do a dependency lookup so I can immediately go and see which products and packages it's in. So it's really helped us be able to nail down and go straight away uh, to that. I don't have to rescan anything to be able to do this because I'm operating it from the SBOM. So this is what's released out there to our customers and I'm able to see, okay, make sure, and so this is where the vulnerability management team is going straight in here and saying, okay, get ready to do security disclosure notices because, you know, we have, en we have enough of products that have this in there that we want to be able to talk about that. And so that's where that speed is happening really quickly. So on Log4j, um, we were able to scan our networks and identify Log4j. For J, but in products, you know, again, that's that could be in that transitive dependency library. You know, if you have a more complete S bomb instead of just uh, the first tier, uh, it's it makes a big difference. Where you're able to see those component packages and look for that, and especially it was tricky with the log for J because um, there were so many nuances. Teams would then have to be able to see if it could if that uh, was exploitable. So. I'm just out of time, so I, I of course, am no, not doing QA, I'm gonna be out here, but I just wanted to talk about, summarize, we have seen improved speed. Um, so if, as d you know, those that are developers in here, um, it takes a, a lot of burden off of you to be able to provide this, because if you have teams focusing on vulnerability management and you're making sure that you have this data and this availability, especially through the CICD pipeline, the quality is so much higher um, from a build SBOM, but that's gonna really improve your customer satisfaction, your vulnerability management team, 
And for us, that transparency and trust is vital. Now, there's lots of opportunities, especially in our company. We've got uh, the SBOMs being created out of a few CICD pipelines, and where we finished the pilots and making sure, you know, from an API call, it can go directly into our tool. And then we also have, of course, various languages, things like that, different pipelines, all running different kinds of things. Um, I already mentioned the binary scanning. And then there's a lot of people not ready. So I meet with suppliers every day and I, and I put in the contracts, I, you know, I want your SBOM and they're like, okay, hold on. <laughs> So, um, you know, I want to really encourage you to be prepared for this because, uh, you know, it's only in certain things, FDA requires it and so on, uh, and the U.S. government can request it, and they do, but your other customers, I'm getting requests for SBOMs, access to it, from customers every day. Again, I have a large customer set. But uh, it is really important for you to be able to provide this visibility. And it actually it helps you encourage with some hygiene. And so thank you all for coming to see me today and see how we leveraged it. Thanks. Thank you.